Oh, wow, a new generation of women is coming forward. Excellent example. Anybody else have a good example of stages? All the student groups, you would have these things going on. Your example with the uh, uh, soccer group is superb. It's really, really good. All right. Then social structure of groups of the group. Did you observe, have any of you observed, the status structure of a group in which you've been involved? For example, the three women, was there any status difference among the three women in the group? Um, I don't, no, I don't think there's a status. I mean, one girl had worked there for like a year longer than me and the other girl, but the other girl had been there for like eight years or something. Okay. That's that fine. Informal, but I don't think it's informal. Okay, uh, that's fine. It's, and it doesn't always happen. Yes? Um, could that be like in groups like for school where we have to write papers and somebody always ends up being like leader that kind of gets things together? So that would be like they have kind of a higher status because they're leading the group? That's a good example of what can happen where earlier I was commenting on somebody being a dominator, mm. you know, and they sort of take charge of the group. And I think this gentleman up here on the right, you were talking to me privately about, he was talking to me privately about uh, your tendency to take over the group. Am I correct in my memory? And <coughs> you, you will see it. It's amazing what we do as humans, despite our knowledge of what this stuff means and what it does to groups and teams. Now, some individuals, and you'll see this when we get to the leadership discussion, just want to take charge. And uh, I, I work on various committees within the school, and um, I have to watch myself. Uh, I'm not always the chair, and you know you defer to the chair of the group to run the show. But if it doesn't quite go where I want it to go, I start to get really antsy about what we are supposed to do. And this is one of the dynamics that occurs in groups. All right. Have you seen on the top of page two on the reverse side, uh, that first row is task roles, maintenance roles, individual roles, which were the items that I summarized earlier. Have you seen these in any of the groups in which you've been involved? The answer is yes, you have. But what are the examples? I should think in the student groups this would come out loud and clear. Not sure about the, the soccer team. Do any of the young women play different roles? Um, I think they do. Um, like there's some girls that just play like keeper and they don't really play on the field. And like, just as far as like a role in the team, like some girls, like they, I teach my girls that they have to talk all the time and say, mark up, like man on, or when they're doing a throw and they need to mark up when the other team is. So there's a few girls that definitely have a role and they'll always say, they'll talk to the other girls and tell them what to do. Okay, that's, that's an excellent example of what this is after. There's what you, how many people on the team? Only nine. Nine. So you have nine young women about the same age. You said they were eight years old. Mm -hmm. They all come from different, are they about the same social status level? Yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, usually soccer is really expensive, yeah. especially for competitive teams. So their families are all pretty much upper middle class. Upper middle class. So you have, you have uniformity in that particular characteristic, which can work for you in trying to build a cohesive team because you're not wrestling with the fact that you have someone who comes from an impoverished background who has to struggle to get the uniforms and stuff uh, compared to someone who is in an upper middle class. In the student teams, everything goes because of our diversity within the Anderson School. You have people from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, presumably unless, and by the way, when I form student teams, I told you this already, I deliberately make them diverse. Occasionally, when I have enough people to do it, especially if it's a one-day kind of workshop or half-day workshop, I will form uh, teams 
that are uniform, like all women and all men, and they're, they're trying to solve the same problem. And it's great fun to watch what happens uh, within the teams in trying to put themselves together. Okay, so let me close with this film scene. And I just looked at the date of the Dirty Dozen, 1967. 40 years old. And that's older than most of the people in the room. And I saw this film when it came out. In 1967, I was back in the U.S., uh, out, of the, uh, out of the Air Force. Uh, it played in San Diego, uh, where I was living at that time. And it's an enduring film. It has is, is lasted as one of the major action films and military films in cinematic history. And this, you're going to see, I just want to read you the names of the actors, who, almost all of whom you will see in this scene. And these are familiar names to you, I think. Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, Charles Bronson, Jim Brown, John Cassavetes, Richard Jack Jackal, that one you may not know, George Kennedy, Trini Lopez, Ralph Meeker you may not know, Robert Ryan, Telly Savalas, and Clint Walker and Robert Weber. Most of those actors, they're almost all dead, but they are extremely well-known Hollywood stars, and some of whom, and Telly Savalas went on to do television, didn't he? he Kojak. Kojak. Tell, yeah, you'll see him there. He plays a lunatic. Uh, anyway, Major Reisman, played by Lee Mar Marvin, is given an almost impossible task to take 12 men who were basically on death row in an army prison, who were thieves and murderers and rapists and all kinds of nasty types of people, and uh, take those people, those men, out of the army prison and build them into a group who are going to advance on a German st stronghold, which is a French chateau. You'll see that later. You're not going to see it in this particular sequence. And I'm going to load the DVD now while talking so that it can get itself set up. <coughs> Now, they're supposed to parachute through behind enemy lines and blow up the chateau before D-Day. Uh, obviously a dangerous mission. But in the course of this, this occurs, the film is two hours and 30 minutes, and the part that is here, if you forgive me, let it queue up. That's the way DVDs do their thing. Uh, Colonel Breed, played by Robert Ryan, whom you will, I think, recognize, Can you put that on screen, Aaron, so I can see where we are? <coughs> no, I don't want that. I want menu. That's the chapter we're going to look at. It's called Breed Contempt, and it's referring to Colonel Breed and the fact that he thinks these, uh, this band of 12 people under Major Reisman's lead are just a group of thieves. They're not real soldiers, and, and uh, he, he comes to the compound where he sh it's a restricted area, and he shouldn't even be in there, but he uses his authority as a full colonel, or his rank, to overwhelm the MP, uh, who says, as you will see, this is a restricted area, sir. What I would like you to do with this, because this is, uh, the, t the group's been together a bit, and do you perceive these people as forming into a cohesive group who are going to carry out this mission? At the moment that, that uh, Colonel Breed arrives, Major Reisman is not there at the compound. He's elsewhere, and he arrives in his jeep. 
So let's see how this goes. Now, unfortunately, the way they have the DVD edited is going to start with a, uh, about a 30 seconds of a party that occurs before this point, and I cannot really easily get, a, get around it. Cohesive or not cohesive? What is the evidence, in your opinion? I believe you are correct. Pretty ragtag group. Not shaved, uniforms are in disarray. Uh, Colonel Reisman, Major Reisman was not even present, and I'm, I'm starting to give it away. I shouldn't say I have said that, but what evidence is there that this was a cohesive group? They were concerned about their friend, like you pointed out, the two guys a few months. Yep. Yeah, and it went down the row, of course, you know, after, after what's his name goes to the end. And so they all know about those two guys. They don't have a formal leader present. Did any one of those 12 men appear to take a leadership role? Which one? The guy that didn't get a monitor and walked down. Yeah, they walked <laughs> down to the end. That, that's... Uh, not terribly important, but I'm curious. Charles Bronson. That, that was Charles Bronson. Uh, they pull together in a remarkable way, and, and, and this is the point in their development as a group where they were totally fragmented at the beginning of the film because they were 12 individuals that came out of jail. And Major Reisman's job is to build them into a cohesive team because they're going to go on an operation where they're all going to depend on each other. And it, it, it's getting there. If you have not seen this film and you have time to do it, it is worth every minute. Uh, and it's, I, looking at the box, I cannot remember whether this was based on a true story. I don't think so. Uh, and the director is Robert Aldrich, who, is, who did The Longest Yard. So it's, it's pretty good stuff. Okay. That's it for today, folks. And we'll come on back. And we're rapidly coming to a close, as you can tell. So we'll see you next time.